And I believe more than anything else, we want to be a church that would say, not our will be done, God, but may your will be done. Think about it. We spend a lot of time coming here every Sunday, and we worship, we, we give, we work, and we, we really all invest quite a bit into this ministry. And as we invest into this ministry, I think we want to make sure as a ministry that our heart is to do what God wants us to do, that we wouldn't have man's agenda or what someone thinks or their opinion, but we would go to the scriptures, we would find out, God, what is your will and purpose for us as a church? And that's what I've been ministering on. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and it says this, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your people today. I pray, Lord, that you would bring an anointing. Uh, God, let the Holy Spirit confirm these words, and let our, our spirits leap within us as the anointing touches not only the speaker, but every heart and every life. God, give us direction and instruction. Let us leave here encouraged, I pray, in Jesus' name. And the church one more time says, <coughs> today we're continuing on the theme. Thank you, Pastor Christy. Appreciate that so very, very much. Amen. And uh, it, it was actually good to see some of the worship team get a little break today. I, I see them sitting out there in the audience and sometimes for the first time in a long time. Let's let all of our worship team know that we appreciate them. Amen. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I want us to have an awareness that we all belong to him, that this church belongs to him. And my desire is that Jesus would be well pleased with us as a ministry, that we would be united together, there would be no division, there would be harmony, and we would all be working together in one mind and one accord to accomplish God's will here for this church, that we would bring glory and honor to him. But in order to please him, we must understand what God's will is for this ministry. And although there's many ways to communicate these truths, uh, I've chosen to use the the, the four signs or the verbiage, the thoughts on our four signs as you walk through the sanctuary door. Some of you are saying, what do you mean, what signs, Pastor? Well, maybe you've been back there enjoying your bagel on Sunday morning, and you looked up and you saw there were signs there that said, connect, grow, serve, and go. And so far, that's what we've been talking about. Our, our, our first purpose is to, if you will, connect. We're here to connect people to God, to reconcile those, all of man, let me say, say this, the greatest need of all mankind, we've got it right here, the greatest human need is for a person to receive Jesus Christ. He's the only answer to the sin nature and to the sin problem that mankind has within them. And so our job is to connect people to God that they might have abundant life. Also, we want to connect us to one another. It is God's will that we would not be lone rangers or off on our own. That's actually a tactic of the enemy to separate us from the church, from the fellowship, get us alone and then to attack us. But when we are stronger together, amen, when we're here, we support. I don't know about you, but I need you, amen, and you need me. We need one another. Christianity was never meant to be a lone ranger situation. We are designed to be in fellowship one with another. It says we're all part of one body. And then the next word that we talked about was grow, is that once we're connected to God and connected to this fellowship, God's desire is that we would grow, that we would not stay the same. And in that message, I talked about how God is never going to change his mind about this. It says that his will, he predestined us, that we would be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, it's God's will that we mature spiritually and we become more like Christ. And he's committed to that. And so our job is to cooperate with God and to realize, you know what, 
I don't want to stay stuck in the same place forever. Amen. I want to move forward. I want to see advancement. I want to see more blessing. I want to have more of what God has for me. And the reality is, is that God is so great. something all together. Amen. Woo, boy, that baby's hot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I can preach now. That, that thing just about snake bit me. Whoa. And, and, and so Jesus is committed to us. He which has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day. And you need to understand this truth. God's never, ever going to change his mind. So you may feel like, man, I just don't want to grow. I don't want to cooperate with God. I don't, you know, it's too hard. But let me just tell you, God's never going to give up. So you might as well let him have his way in your life now because God's got more patience than you do. He's got more time than you do. And God is going to have his way in our lives one way or another. So let's say yes to God and let's determine that, you know what, I'm not going to stay the same. I'm going to grow and I am going to mature. And I'm so glad that we are willing, amen, to cooperate with God. And how many of you know when you become more like Christ, you'll be a better husband, you'll be a better wife, amen, you'll be a better daddy, a better mommy. And, and so growing has its benefits. And then we talked about serve. How many of you know Jesus is the supreme servant? He left heaven donned the robes of an earthly man, came to earth, and he came not to be served, but to serve. And we talked about how when we are serving, that's when we are most like Jesus Christ. And it's God's will that we as a church give you opportunity to get plugged in, to be able to exercise your gifts, your talents, and that together we would all be in harmony working, amen, for the faith and for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing lives changed like through this baptism, seeing them discipled as Pastor Brian read, and working together, amen, that the church would see increase. We want to be busy about the Father's business of serving one another. And so I believe that God wants us, amen, to be servants, amen. I, I've always said if I had 10,000 lives to live, I could not serve him enough to ever give back even a fraction of what he's done for me. And so serving is a privilege. And now we're going to move on to the last point of this series, and that is the word go. Everybody say go. go. Here we're talking about taking the gospel or the good news about Jesus outside the four walls of this church. Really what I mean is having impact and influence beyond this building. And we must understand that it is God's will for us to impact, amen, outside and for us to be the church outside the four walls of this building. The word go by itself implies a moving from where you're at and moving forward or moving into another place or another location. It's when we take what happens here on Sunday mornings and we move it outside the church. It's when we move from this place, this rallying point on Sunday morning, and we go out to our places of work, into our grocery stores, our neighborhoods, and we go out bearing the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives. It's about us having impact and influence out in the marketplace. And when we think about going, sometimes we think about an, e an organization or an organized event. But that's not what I'm going to preach on today because I'm not going to talk about let's have a big crusade and do all that. I'm sure we will do some of those things, 
But I want to talk about a more organic approach, a more generic approach, and, and, and that we would realize that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead it dwells in us and that we have the power. We are empowered to go out and to make a difference, amen, in our community, amen, in our places of work. Wherever we go, Jesus goes with us. And he says this, he says, you are the salt of the earth. In other words, he wants us to be the, uh, the, the spread the fragrance, the seasoning of Christ wherever we go. He said, we are the light of the world. And how many of you no, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Friends, I believe today that God wants to shine his light through us. And he wants us, if you will, to make a difference wherever he places us. With social media so huge right now, I've heard this word a whole lot. The word influencer. Amen. And, and, and so I looked it up. Do you know an influencer you have to have 10,000 followers. Now, they had micro-influencers with less. But to be a bona fide influencer, you have to have 10,000 followers. And so that's what I want for us as a church. I want us to become influencers. Not so much on Instagram or TikTok, talk, whatever that is. <laughs> Unless it's all about Jesus on your platform, then that's okay. But I want us to be influencers for Jesus in this community of Santa Cruz. Amen. <laughs> An influencer is one who exerts influence. It's one who impacts or changes the behavior of another. I'm really talking about us bearing the presence of God just doing life. I'm not talking about organization and events. I'm talking about us being the church and wherever we go, taking Jesus with us, amen, and letting us be an influence, amen, because God is working in our lives. And what happens is we begin to influence others for God instead of them influencing us for the world. And we begin to spread the love and the joy, amen, and the power of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty contagious and infectious to me. Amen. I want to see God's spirit working and moving in our lives. That was a big introduction. Okay, four reasons or four ways we can influence or impact others for Christ. Number one, by our changed lives. How many of you know when people see our lives changed, it speaks to them? Amen. An illustrated sermon, an illustrated uh, a scripture, an illustrated. We are living epistles read by all men. And when people see what God has done in our lives, it influences them. The story of the Gadarean is so powerful. Listen to this. Here's a man who was demon possessed. Secondly, he lived in the tombs. Thirdly, nobody could help him. The doctors couldn't help him. Social workers couldn't help him. Family couldn't help him. Friends couldn't help him. All they could do was try to control him with chains. But he would snap the chains in two. It says they could not tame him. I thought, why did they use that word tame? He was a wild man, totally uncontrollable. He was out of his mind. He was so tormented he couldn't sleep, but would stay up all night cutting himself and crying out through the night. He was hurting and he was in pain. And the scripture said he had an unclean spirit. It was for this man's benefit. Listen to this, Pastor. It was for this man's benefit that Jesus came to the place of the tombs. He came looking specifically for this man, he came looking to help and to deliver him. And when Jesus saw him, he commanded the unclean spirit to leave him. And so Jesus delivers him, sets him free, does for him what, how many, how many of you know Jesus can do for you what nobody else can do? Amen. He sets this man free, does for him what no one else can do. But when the townspeople came out to investigate, they were shocked. Because Why? Because they saw the change. 
You know what they saw? They saw this man sitting. They had, this guy had never sat still before. Amen. They saw him, if you will, clothed. The guy ran around naked all the time. Amen. And they saw him in his right mind. What a transformation. And I came today to tell you that Jesus still changes lives. Amen. And when a life is changed, it brings an impact. It, 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 and Jesus told him, he says, he says, can I go with you, Jesus, when Jesus is taking us? He says, no, no, go back to your home and tell your friends how good God's been to you, how he's shown you compassion, and how he has changed your life. And he goes back to Decapolis. And he starts telling everybody, look what the Lord has done. He turned that city upside down. Now, can you imagine his testimony? He, I Man, I was out of my mind. I ran around naked most of the time, constantly tormented. But one day, a man named Jesus came out to the tombs. Can I tell you, it was the best day of my life. I've never met anyone like him before. And at his command, I was delivered and set free. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, not only tell them what he's done for great things and he's changed, but tell them this. Tell them that God has had or how God has had compassion on you. You need to understand this. The reason this change came about was because of God's compassion. I want you to understand this. He came to him in his mess. He came to him when there was nothing good in him. He came to him when he couldn't change himself. He came to him when no one else could help him. He came to him even though he's the one who had messed his own life up. It was his own fault he was in this mess. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because Jesus said, I want you to go home to your friends, to your home and to tell your friends. He once had a normal home and he had friends like everybody else, but he started making poor choices. Let me tell you today, we have to be careful. Because it's those little foxes that spoil the body. It's those little first wrong choices. And, 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 and what happens is that the enemy is looking to get a foothold in our lives. And the Bible says, give not place to the devil. In other words, don't let him in at all. Amen. And, and, and he began to make wrong choices. And I, I want to tell you, sin will take you farther than you want to go. <laughs> And he messed his own life up. But in spite of that, Jesus comes looking for him. How many of you know this is good news? Do you know what this means? Today, Jesus wants to show us his compassion. He wants to come to us, even if we're the ones who messed everything up. Even if there's nothing good in our lives. Even if there's no human reason why God would want anything to do with us. Compassion is God granting even to the unworthy favor, benefits, opportunities, and particularly salvation by Christ. In the context, Jesus changed his life. I don't know about you, but this is a reminder I needed. <laughs> See, my life was radically changed. When I came to the Lord, it, it wasn't, well, try to do a little better. No, he set me free and delivered me. Amen. I walked into a church one way. I walked out. The cusser was gone. The drinker was gone. The smoker was gone. My life was changed instantly. And God gave me. Now, I had a grandma who prayed for years, and I was a recipient of her grace. But guess what? I needed to be reminded of how radically God changed my life. You know how long it's been now? My friend said, six months, you're going to get back to being the same old Chuck Tuck we know. Amen. It's been 40 years now. 40 years I've been serving the Lord. All because he changed my life that day. But this is what we need to be reminded of because some of you can relate to what I'm saying. I remember when God changed my life. 
But do you also know and believe sitting here today that God can change your life again today? That God is in the life-changing business. And when no one else can change you, mama can't change you, all of your self-help books can't change you, there is a God in heaven who can bring about a lasting change in your life. And he can take you from, if he brought you from where you were to where you're at, he can take you from where you're at, amen, to where you need to be. He can still change our lives. If I had Jesus' business card here today, it would say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, specialist in changing lives. And here's the thing. We got to get this message out to a lost and a dying world that Jesus changes lives. I tell you what, I, I, I want to get back to telling people how he changed my life. We need to get back to telling people what he's done for us. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm not ashamed of what he did for me. And it's time we start giving God credit once again and magnifying him and telling people, look what the Lord has done. He changed my life. And what's so nice about this is anybody can do this. You don't have to be a Bible scholar or know the Roman road to salvation. You don't have to, you don't have to know anything. Except for this is what God did for me. He changed my life. We can impact our community by sharing how Christ has changed our lives and how good he's been to us. A changed life is a powerful way to let people know that God is alive and that God is a good God. Another way we influence and impact others is by our hope in God, when people see that we are people of hope, when people see others fall apart at the seams, amen, and we face the same thing, and we're calm, cool, collective, trusting in God, hey, when they see we stay true to God, even though we go through the fire and go through the flood, and we keep serving Him, we keep living for Him, even as we go through difficult times, we're faithful to God. That is a powerful witness and testimony to this world. Amen. Because we don't lose hope. We don't give up. We know that our hope is in God, that he's going to come through for us. He's going to challenge us, but he's going to deliver us when we face overwhelming things. Amen. He is going to be there for us, and that will impact people when we live and act like that's the truth truth. My dad told me, son, you're crazy to leave and go to Santa Cruz and take that little church. What are you thinking, son? You're crazy. And I said, don't worry, dad. God's in it. God will take good care of me and the family. Don't you worry about that. We had hope and faith in God. We moved over to Santa Cruz and dad started visiting Oh, it was, it was something else. He would sit back in that back seat. and <laughs> My dad was a rascal, man. One time, Betty Lou went out and picked up a bunch of homeless people and brought them to church. And this girl was standing right over here. And she's worshiping. And all she has on is a sweater wrapped around her top. And she's doing this. And, I look, and then my dad's looking over there. I said, <laughs> I said oh, my Lord. <laughs> Anyways. My dad came and visited, and after a period of time, he started changing his tune a little bit. You know why? Because my dad saw, even though we left it all behind and came over here to pastor this church, that God took care of me, took care of my wife, took care of all the kids, that God was faithful to take care of all of our family. And he found out that God's a faithful God. And I can't help but to believe later on when he received Christ that that had an impact or an influence on him because he saw what God had done for his son who was crazy to go to Santa Cruz. I got to talk about Abraham for just a minute. Abraham says he believed in hope against all hope. In other words, against all hope, Abraham believed in hope. I got to just, just get this. God told Abraham, amen, to leave your kindred, leave your country, leave your people, family behind, and go. And, and, and Abraham says, 
Where are we going to, God? God says, don't worry about that. I'll tell you later. I'll show you later. And he says, I'm going to give you so many offspring, Abraham. It's going to be like the sand on the seashore. Okay, God, well, did you know that my wife is barren? Oh, don't worry about that either. It'll be all right. Abraham went out not knowing. Man, why do we always have to know? Why do we always have to see the whole picture before we'll get out of the boat and start moving? Amen. Why do we always have to know? Every, we don't need to know anything. We just need to know that our hope is in God. And that we are trusting God. And against all hope, Abraham believed in hope. So he goes out, right? So now there's, what, a 25-year. You think you've been waiting a while for that to come through for you? He waited 25 years for that promised child. Man, we get a three-minute delay at a red light. We fall apart at the seams. And so Abraham kept his hope. Even when now, so huge delay, right? So now what happens next? Now he's 100 years old and she's 90. Now they're past the time of childbearing and now it's physically impossible. What does God say? Don't worry about it, Abraham. It'll be fine. So let me put it to you this way. He went out not knowing where he was going. He went out with his wife being barren. He went out and there was a 25-year delay. And now it is physically impossible for them to have children because of their age. That's why it says, against hope, Abraham believed in hope. And I believe this is why he did so good. Because his hope was not in his circumstances. His hope was in God. And I think we have this bad habit of putting our hope in our circumstances. When everything's looking good, man, it's all chill and cool, man. But when things aren't looking so good, I can't believe this is happening to me. Today, let's take our eyes off of our circumstances. And let's put our eyes on him. And let's ask God to restore our hope in him today. It's a terrible thing when a person loses hope. I read about 29-year-old Orlando Harris. He opened fire at a high school in St. Louis. I think it was last week. AR-15, type of an assault rifle. Killed two people, injured four others. The investigators found a handwritten note which read in part, I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. I've never had a girlfriend. I've never had a social life. I've been an isolated loner my entire life. What happened? He had lost hope. He lost hope that he would ever have any friends. He lost hope that he would ever have any family. You know, it says God sets the solitary in family. Oh, I wish he would have found a church and some people that love Jesus. He lost hope that he would ever have a girlfriend. He lost hope that he would ever have a social life. And as I read about this, I said, if only he could have meant the Jesus that I know. Jesus would have given him hope. Jesus would have restored him. Jesus would have helped him to get up and to keep moving. See, it's a very dangerous thing for us to lose hope. And in a room of people this large, there are undoubtedly are people in here that are on the verge of losing hope. And I came here today to tell you, don't do it. Don't go there. You need to change the channel. Quit listening to how bad things are and how it's never going to work out because God is a God of all hope. And he says that his hope is the anchor of our soul. And church, we need to come back to believing God, trusting God, and hoping in God that God is going to come through for us. We must hold on. We can't give up on our dreams and our desires. We need to have hope that the best is yet to come. We can't give up on our children. We need to have hope that we're going to see them doing well and serving God. We can't give up on our families. We have to have hope they'll be blessed. We can't give up on our church. We have to have hope that this church is going to grow and impact this city. 
We can't give up on one another because I believe God's best for you is yet to come. And i got to keep believing we must hold on to our hope. And just because we're Christians, it doesn't isolate us from the problems and the challenges and the difficulties of life. It's just that with Jesus, we never, ever, no, never have to face them alone. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I, I wrote this in my notes. Guess what? Never means never. Never, never leave you or forsake you. When we are going through difficulties, we can have his promises. We can have hope because he promises we'll never be alone. He promises us his presence. He promises us his help. He promises that he will strengthen us. And here's the clincher. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Here's the clincher. God says, I'll get in the midst of that which is bad and challenging. And I will work through that to bring good to your life. It may not be good what you went through or what you're going through, but I promise you, I will bring good out of it. We have hope, listen to this, because we believe in God's promise of his future faithfulness. We have hope because we believe in God's promise of his future faithfulness. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Do you hear that? He says, I will hold, I will take you by the right hand, and I will hold your right hand, saying unto thee, fear not, I will help you. Listen to this in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O harbor lighters, amen, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, do you hear God speaking to you today? Fear, don't allow fear to enter in. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. Did you hear that? He calls you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Now, neither shall the flame scorch you. When we live in hope, it's a powerful thing. And today, God wants to restore your hope. He wants you to keep believing. He doesn't want you to get discouraged and give up. So we have an impact in people's lives when they see the change in our lives. And also when they see our hope in God. And they see us trusting God. Thirdly, we impact and influence people by how we live our lives. I love it when people see how us Christians live. We, we had a um, New Year's Eve, we come in and we pray and we have some, you know, uh, every year for like 30 something years, I've been on my knees at the New Year's Eve at midnight praying in the new year. Just a tradition I've had. So we're here, we're playing games. And there was this one fella came in. It was obvious that he was unchurched and so we're playing this game, it's charades. I don't know what the name is. It, name of it is, but it's four cards, you put it on a timer, uh, gestures, yeah. And so you have to, to, to look at the card, and you got it. So if it's a bird, you go like this, you know. And, you, and your team has to go, bird, 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 you know. And, and so this guy was up there, and there's four cards. The first two, he did lousy. No, I mean, he didn't do good at all. And finally, the third one, man, he did it good, and people, someone called it out, yes, and he got down, and right when his fingertip touched the card, it dropped. And all of a sudden, you heard the most natural expression from an unchurched person, O-S-H, as loud as could be, all right, you could have heard it sitting back in the cheap seats. And we all go, Ooh. so this is great, this Man, we got unchurched person in church here today. This is wonderful. But I kind of watched him, and I looked around, and he, you could just see he's kind of looking around, and he sees us just laughing, cutting up, having all this fun. And he sees that there's no drugs, there's no alcohol. There, none of that stuff's happening. We're just having fun in Jesus. And, 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 and he notices there's something different about the atmosphere. It's almost like he was saying, wow, is this real? 
And people actually get amazed. I've observed this for years. People get amazed that Christians can have so much fun, amen, without doing all the stuff, amen, that they do. Because Christ being in the room makes all the difference. It impacts their lives. Chanel, such a blessing. Our worship leader here for decades, I don't forever, it seemed like. And, and um, uh, she was going to go down. We, we even drove down there. Man, we did the school tour. We did everything. And it, it was a large Christian university called Azuzu in Southern California. I mean, we talked to the counselors, got her registered. She was ready to go. So this big Sunday, grand celebration, we're sending her off to go to Bible school. Amen. And I get a phone call on Saturday night. I mean, we sent out flyers. We've been announcing this for, for a week or more, a couple weeks. And, and we had this place decorated with big old arches of balloons. We were sending her off in style. And she calls me the night before and says, Dad, I got something I need to talk to you about. I said, oh, yeah, what? <laughs> What's that? Well, uh, let me come over and talk to you in person. Mm, all right. So she shows up with Pastor Brian and Brother Brad. Where's, is Brad in here? He's over there watching Kaiser. And, and, and they come in there and they sit down and Chanel says, Dad, we've been praying tonight and I just feel like the Lord's leading me to stay here and not to go to Bible school. And I just, my little computer is going, ching, 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 and I'm just digesting this. But let me tell you something. I didn't lose it. I didn't let steam come out both of my ears and turn bright red. And Brad Shelton sitting there looked at me, and he saw my response. And you know what he said later on? He said, that so impacted my life because I'm not used to that. But let me tell you something. We were anointing Naomi's belly with oil before Chanel was even born. When she came out of the womb, we anointed her with oil. We anointed her room all the time, the room she slept in. And we prayed over her, pled the blood of Jesus over her for 20 years straight. How many of you know, pastor could be cool as a cucumber? Man, I prayed over that girl, man. I ain't going to sweat this. And because I just, well, honey, whatever you feel God's will is, with a smile on my face, and Brad's like... Oh, man, I can't believe all this they went through to get signed up, and she's going down. and have, So she had to come to church the next day, say, well, guess what, everybody? I changed my mind. They all came with gifts and presents and everything. It was a total, total shifting of gears. And, and, and the thing is, is that it impacted Brad's life. Could have had a part in why he uh, received Christ. I don't know, but it, it, it made an influence when he saw the response uh, to Chanel, and so, amen, and he stuck with it because he ended up marrying her, okay. I'll tell you, when people uh, notice, they notice how we treat the unlovely. How many of you know some people are so easy to love and get along with, but there's those thorn in the side people, you know, the ones that suck all the joy right out of you? Yeah, how do we treat those people? See, how do we treat those that aren't friendly toward us? People notice that stuff. And then when they see how we live our lives, it impacts them. How do we treat people that don't deserve our love? When we go to see the owner of the company, do we treat the receptionist down here with the same respect and the same love as we treat the owner of the company? People notice that kind of stuff. And God calls on us to love and to respect all people regardless of their title or their position. Let me just say to you, if somebody comes and wants to wash your car windows, you may not want it, amen, but don't you be rude and mean to them. You be polite, respect and love everybody that you come in contact with. People will notice that, and, and people will notice whether you freely forgive others. Ah, uh, that turkey. And they can tell whether you hold a grudge or not, amen. And, and people notice, and the way we live, live our lives, it impacts others. And when they see that you freely forgive people, and that offenses, I, I kind of try to walk in an attitude of pre-forgiveness. And when people offend me, I try for it to be water on a duck's back. 
I just keep moving forward. Amen. I got too many important things to do to let some kind of root of bitterness or, or, or a grudge or something like that spring up in my heart. How about do we display joy? <laughs> Pastor, you don't know how hard life is. I sure do. You know the person who ex- who's, who's joyful? Their life is just as hard as yours. See, the Bible says that we all suffer the same afflictions. Being joyful is a fruit of the Spirit. If, if we're not joyful, we need to get a hold of God a little better. Amen. And allow His fruit to come out in our lives. And so, do we display joy? People know whether you're an old sour puss or not. Do we keep our cool or do we blow it at every little thing? Except now driving's not fair because you know there are some bad drivers on the road. Do we keep our cool? How about this? Do we exhibit grace to people when they flub up? Or do we become critical and harsh and judgmental on people? People notice this kind of stuff. And so we impact others by how we live our lives. Lastly, and this is the final point. Sorry the sermon's so long today. I had 30 notes, 30 pages of notes. Amen. By our acts of devotion, people are influenced when they see our acts of devotion. The thing about Christianity is that it's not a program. It's not a club you join. It is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus values us so much that he laid his life down to save us and to bring us the unmerited favor of God. To rescue us from the power of sin. And because it's a personal relationship, it requires devotion on both sides. There's no question he's devoted to you and to me and to us. But what he wants for us to do is he wants us to be devoted completely to him. He will not accept half-hearted devotion. He says, I would that you would be hot or cold and not lukewarm. He says, that's totally unacceptable. And you see, people don't understand this unless they have encountered Christ and have this personal relationship. So people think that when we're this devoted to Christ, they think we are crazy. What? You don't go out clubbing no more? No. What? No more premarital sex? Are you crazy? No, it grieves the Holy Spirit and it doesn't please God. You volunteer way too much time at that church. What's wrong with you? Well, I would do so much more for Jesus after he's been so good to me. Every Sunday you go to church. Isn't that a bit extreme? Every Sunday? He says, I'll spend my whole week, too, putting God first in my life, just not on Sundays. What? You tithe to the church? Did you suffer brain damage somewhere? When people see our devotion to Christ, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They think we're a few fries short of a happy meal. And I'll never forget, I went for a drive out of town. And um, they asked me the next day, well, who did you go with? I said, oh, I went with Jesus. (laughs) Who? Who? I went with Jesus. I just wanted to spend the day with Jesus. They looked at me like I was a $3 bill. Dude, you're weird. That look, you know what I mean? You're so weird, dude. We are to live our lives completely devoted to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And compared to what he's done for us, no sacrifice is too great. And people know when we're devoted to God, they can see it. And when they see, they they may not like it, but they can see when we are devoted to God. The most powerful sermon you can ever preach is probably not with words. It's when people see how devoted you are to the Lord. We had no worship leader here. This is Chanel's story day today. (laughs) Amen. She was attending college down in Fresno. 
we didn't have our worship leader, so Chanel decides she's going to come all the way to Santa Cruz every weekend and do worship for us. Do you know how far Fresno is and how long it takes? It's a three-hour drive each way. She drove six hours every Sunday, every weekend, so she could come. People looked at her like, you are crazy, girl. You driving that far every Sunday to come? What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? No, she, that's devotion to God. It's devotion to God. Maybe to dad a little bit. I don't know. Leanne, people probably think you're crazy. You drive in every Sunday for seven years now. Whew. Seven years. And, and, and here's the thing. How many of you are you're preaching a sermon? You're preaching a sermon. That's what we don't realize. God puts people that are devoted to him in front of us and around us so that we can look at their lives and learn something. And can I tell you what sermon you're preaching? The sermon you're preaching is that if you live five miles away, you have no excuse for not getting in your car and being down here on Sunday. And that's what God's trying to say to you. Amen. He's preaching that sermon right through Sister Leanne. Have you ever thought about that? Jordan, away at college, we had no drummer. Every weekend, Jordan drove, I think he drove two hours every Sunday to come down here and to play the drums. Now, what sermon does that preach? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I could help with that class once every three months, Sister Naomi. I'm not sure. Here's, here's a young man. Young man. And here he is driving four hours every Sunday so he can play the drums and serve on the worship team. That's a sermon. Friends, that is a sermon. And, and they're all around us. It's not just Chanel and Jordan and Leanne. It, it's all around us. Pastor Brian and Morgan. They packed up, left everything ba behind, came down here to serve Jesus. They had it made up there. But God called them to come down here. And they said, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your will. How many of you, that's a sermon for us. It, it, the, it's not just for an associate pastor to make a sacrifice to serve God. It's all of, if you ever think serving God's going to be easy, can I talk to you after church for just a little while in private? Amen. Serving God is never, ever going to be easy. And these stories should inspire us because we see their devotion to God and when we see that, it should inspire, inspire us because they're not super Christians. They're just like you and they're just like me. They are not, there are no super Christians. They get tired just like we do. They got laundry to do just like we do. They got everything just like we do. And, and so their devotion impacts people. Remember in Proverbs, it says that wisdom cries out at the city gates. What God says, there's wisdom all around us. We'll just open our eyes and look what's going on around us. We can learn a lot just by watching people, just by seeing how people live their lives, just what's, what's going down. And, and, and I can tell you right now that God is preaching sermons to this congregation constantly about people that are devoted to him and challenging us. You see, if you want to make an impact in this community, when you go out there, people have to see that you're a person who is devoted to Jesus Christ. That he's more, I don't know about you, I always say, I love my wife with all my heart, but I love Jesus with all my heart and then some. I wouldn't have her if it were not for Jesus. I wouldn't have any of these children if it were not. I, I was a sinner, lost in sin, no hope. Naomi was already saved at 16, attending some little, uh, how would I know God would take me to a little church where Naomi would be there, and that would be my life partner, and that he would give me a family, would give me a church. To, I had no idea, no idea at all. But he did give me a, a job, and that was to drive the church van. And I'm here today because I was devoted to God, and I drove that church van the very best I could. And you don't need to do a lot. Now, it says, any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, the plow means working for God, serving God, is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
So we go through what I call transitional changes or dispensations in our life. And listen, you may now have new kids at home or whatever. Well, you may not be able to do what you did when you didn't have the kids. But let me just tell you what, don't take your hand off the plow. You still have to do something for the Lord, no matter what station in life you find yourself. Because when you serve him and take care of what belongs to him, God is going to put his blessing on you, on your family, and on everything that pertains to your life. God's going to flood you. He says, I will bless whom I will bless, and I will do what I decide to do, says the Lord. And I'll command a blessing into your life. Can I tell you the greatest thing a person can do is to put their effort into serving God. It pays the highest return. It's better than any stock market. It's better than any precious metal. If you want the highest return on your life and your investment, spend it serving others for the kingdom of God. And God will multiply his favor and blessing in your life. I haven't done this, amen, as an official survey, but I've taken unscientific surveys and I've seen young people who gave it all to Jesus and served him and I've seen others that don't do that they don't serve God and I see them struggle five times everything they do is five times harder than the ones that are serving God I'm not this ain't no joke art a joke I'm telling you that I see this with my own eyes and I, you can go try to do life on your own, but if you put God first and serving him first, whatever else you do, I believe he will make it five times easier and give you favor, give you abilities, give you open doors, and help you to accomplish those things that you want to accomplish in your life. But let me ask you this, that which you want to accomplish, why are you doing it? Why do you want to accomplish that? Because the only answer God accepts is because I want to do that to glorify Jesus. So if you run your own business, you're just not in the plumbing business, my friend. You're in the Jesus business. You run that plumbing company to glorify God. And if you have employees, you're their pastor. Amen. And you run that company to give God glory and to honor him. And when you do that, watch out because God will put his Midas touch on that plumbing company. And God will bless you. I've seen it happen. I'm just not talking stuff. Amen. I read in a book. God multiplied me and Brother Rice. The guy couldn't paint the broadside of a barn. I could, we were in the wrong business. It was a sign business. And let me just tell you, he made it one of the most prosperous sign companies in the town at that time. And I couldn't do nothing with signs. He had had a stroke. There was, it, it was a hot mess. But Jesus put his hand of blessing on that sign company. And it paid our, it paid our way all through Bible college. Amen. Amen. God's good. God's good. So the whole concept is that we would understand God's purpose for the church. His purpose is that we would connect people to Christ, that we would be connected to the church, that we would grow and mature and cooperate with God because God's never, ever... Well, I don't know if I want to grow, Pastor. I'm sorry. It's not optional. If you're a Christian, it's not optional. He says he is 100% committed to that, and he's never going to change his mind. So we grow, then we serve, and then now we go. And by the way we live our lives, organically, generically, wherever we go, we take the presence of Jesus with us. And because they see a changed life, it's a powerful witness. Because they see how we live our lives, it's a powerful witness. Because they see that we have hope in God, it's a powerful witness. And so, friends, when they see our devotion to Christ, a powerful witness, that's what I want. That's the church I want us to be, that we would go out and impact. Guess what? When we're that devoted to Christ, we don't even have to try. We just show up. Just get anointed and show up. Just get filled with the word, with his presence, and show up. That's all you got to do. Let God and the Holy Spirit do the rest. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you so much. God, right now, I'm asking for you to speak, for you to stir our hearts, oh God. We want to be the church that you want 
us to be. We want to say not our will be done, but your will be done, dear Lord. God, I pray even now you would stir the hearts of your people. Perhaps you're here and you'd say, Pastor, what I need is that connection to God. I'm not currently serving God. I've, I've not made a surrender of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, it's the most important and the best decision a person can ever, ever make. So I want to start right there. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, you're speaking to me right now. I need to receive Christ. Would you just lift your hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor. Lift your hand up. Pray for me, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. I appreciate that so much. Well, church, I don't know about you, but I don't want to play church. I want to be the church that God wants us to be. And scripturally, I believe that this, although there's other ways to communicate it, but I believe this here is God's will for this church. And I invite you to be a part of it. I invite you to roll up your sleeves. I invite you to come and be a part of what God is doing. Like Pastor Brian said, we're going to look back in a while. We're going to say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. I'm going to ask Christy if she will minister during this time of altar service. We have prayer teams. If you would like prayer, you can come down to my right here and pray, and our prayer team will pray with you. If you want to pray and have no one come and, and uh, interrupt your prayer and you want to pray alone, to my left, this is open over here. If you want to pray in your seat, that's fine too, but let's take this message and let's, let's just chew on it for a minute. Let's worship the Lord together for a few more minutes this morning.